Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight or whenever you are viewing this online. My name is Ann Bennett. I'm the executive director of the Laurel Historical Society here in Maryland. And I am joined with uh, several of our staff members, Abby Carver, uh, who's our outreach and education coordinator. Uh, we also have our museum administrator, Genevieve Hernandez, uh, and they're all going to be helping out behind the scenes to monitor the chat and the Q&A. And so this is a traditional webinar, so we, that means we cannot see or hear you, but we definitely want to interact with you. So please feel free to drop any questions or comments that you have into the chat. We love to know where you're from, what you're thinking, uh, if you've been to the museum, how we can connect with you. And if you have any questions about uh, the uh, presentation as we go along, uh, drop those in the Q&A. A, that way we can uh, filter it as we go through uh, our evening tonight and we'll be able to answer your questions toward the end of our program. So our speaker tonight I'm very excited to introduce is uh, JP Hodnett. He's the paleontologist and program coordinator for Dinosaur Park. Uh, it's part of the Department of Parks and Rec uh, for the Mar Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission uh, from Prince George's County uh, and it's also featured in our exhibits. Uh, so if you head down Route 1 South, uh, pretty soon you'll get to the Conti area and you'll be in prime dinosaur land. So I also want to make sure that uh, everyone knows where Dinosaur Park is and has an opportunity uh, to really take advantage of um, kind of this uh, also hidden gem. Uh, I know that uh, I hate hearing that term apply to the Lore Museum. So JP, I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, but it really kind of is mind-blowing to know that uh, we are following in the footsteps uh, of dinosaurs uh, every time we drive in and around Laurel. So uh, I want to thank you so much, JP, for being, being with us tonight. Uh, and again, thank you uh, in the audience for joining us. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, and, and JP, I will let you take it away and tell us all about the dirt you've been digging up on dinosaurs. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, so uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so let me go ahead and see if I can switch, share my screen here and get our presentation going. Um, and it's always a trick once you share it and you have to find a little uh, button to start the presentation. But there it is. All right. So yes, um, again, yes, my name is uh, J.P. Hunnett. And as Ann uh, mentioned, I am the paleontologist and program coordinator for uh, the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission, Dinosaur Park. Um, and as she also mentioned, yeah, we are located uh, just south of Laurel off of uh, Route 1 near Conti Road. And we are a very special place. We are one of the few active uh, dinosaur fossil localities um, in the Mid-Atlantic region. And uh, we are also one of the few places probably in the entirety of the United States that allows the public to come in and help us um, search for fossils and then also help us um, collect and curate uh, those fossil resources from within our park. And you get full credit for it um, when you do so. Um, but uh, so my presentation today is talking about the world of Dinosaur Park. Um, it's a very interesting uh, story in terms of not only the history, but also just kind of the ancient ecology that goes along with this. And so I'll go ahead and get started. And I always like to start uh, my presentation uh, about Dinosaur Park with its history. Um, and uh, I'll keep it brief because it can be pretty extensive. But uh, the best way to describe the, the history of discoveries of dinosaurs uh, within um, our region is uh, kind of broken down into four phases. Uh, the first phase is the initial discovery. Uh, so the actual year this actually all started was in 1858. And what happened is uh, two dinosaur teeth were collected uh, from an old, um, was old to us now, but from an, an active iron uh, ore mining operation, um, probably not far from uh, where Montpelier is today um, as part of the, uh, the Snowden family properties. And it was managed by uh, some other individuals. Uh, but anyway, so two teeth were collected, and they were actually handed off to a, a federal chemist by the name of Philip Thomas Tyson. And uh, Tyson knew of a dentist uh, in Baltimore by the name of Dr. Christopher Johnson. Now, Dr. Christopher Johnson um, had an interesting background. He was actually a uh, pioneer in the study of the internal structure of teeth by doing cross-sections. And so he 
was also kind of following the 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 latest uh, dinosaur fossil discoveries that were being made in the United States. And you have to understand, in, in the 1800s, this is basically when uh, American paleontology was in its infancy. There weren't really that many paleontologists in our country. Um, in fact, there's probably technically one at the time. And uh, but things were being discovered, and some of the first fossils were actually were discovered in New Jersey near Haddonfield. Um, the very first dinosaur was a dinosaur called Hadrosaurus. And it was found 10 years prior to the discovery of the of the first fossils found in Maryland. But in the same year, 1858, those dinosaur fossils were, were announced and belonged to a dinosaur called Hadrosaurus. So anyway, so Dr. Johnson got these teeth and he was able to basically do cross sections of them. And he noticed that there was a kind of starburst pattern on the inside of the tooth. And so in 1859, in a dental journal, he writes up this kind of like overview of what we knew about ancient life in, in uh, the United States at the time. And a lot of it was kind of referring to a lot of discoveries in uh, New Jersey, but it's like almost a one-line sentence. He said, um, even though there's these amazing discoveries being found in New Jersey, we here in Maryland have our own ancient giant reptile, which I have dubbed Astrodon. And of course, this is from his observations of the cross-section of the teeth. And that's where it stayed, and that's actually how the name Astrodon – was established was just this one line sentence um but uh fast forward um approximately a little over 10 years later um those two teeth were handed off to actually the first true american paleontologist by the name of dr joseph lighty and lighty worked at the american uh, academy of natural sciences in philadelphia and in a publication in 1865 he went through everything that's been uh, that was known for nelly uh Hadrosaurus with some also giant marine reptiles, but he also uh, formally described um, these two teeth that were called Astrodon, and he basically uh, called them Astrodon Johnsoni as the binomial name, which every species on the planet is given, um, and he gave the last species name Johnsoni uh, in honor of Dr. Christopher Johnson. And initially, when Joseph Lighty described these fossils, he was comparing them with some fossils that were found in England. And he thought these teeth that were found um, essentially uh, where Dinosaur Park is now uh, were belong to an armored type dinosaur called Haliosaurus. And that's kind of, kind of important to remember um, for the next phase of our history here. So in phase two, um, this is what was also known as the Bone Wars era, because at this time, um, two more pro uh, prominent paleontologists uh, had this professional rivalry uh, trying to outdo each other in terms of discoveries. And uh, their names were Othniel Charles Marsh, which is very important to our story at Dinosaur Park, and another paleontologist by Edward Drinker Cope. So a little background on Marsh. Marsh was a paleontologist at Yale University. He um, basically uh, got his uncle um, to build what's now known as the uh, Peabody Museum, which is a, is a, uh, a historic but also world-class um, natural history museum at Yale University. And uh, uh, Edward Cope, he was actually with the Academy of Natural Sciences, and he worked with Lighty. Um, he also worked at the University of, Pens of Pennsylvania. Anyway, uh, Marsh was actually very good friends with John Wesley Powell. And for those of you who do not know who John Wesley Powell is, um, John Wesley Powell is, is famously known for actually uh, rafting down the Green and into the Colorado Rivers and was one of the first um, white explorers of essentially the Grand Canyon region. In fact, he's famously known for uh, climbing up the slopes of uh, Grand Canyon from the Colorado River all the way to the top. And if you don't know about John Wesley Powell, he was a, a one-armed uh, adventurous man um, but what uh, Wesley, uh, John Wesley Powell went on to do uh, is he helped establish the United States Geological Survey, and so which was uh, based in Washington, D.C. And so Powell actually tapped Marsh and said, hey, you know, um, we're, we're setting up the USGS, um, and we keep hearing rumors about dinosaur fossils and other prehistoric life being found in and around the Washington, D.C. area. Um, would you be willing to come down yourself or send one of your staff members to look around and kind of help us kind of give a, uh, give us a better understanding, like how old these rocks are based on the fossils and, you know, who knows what else you might find and we'll help fund you and, and things like that. And so Marsh was like, sure, I'll do that. I'll send my best man out there. And his name was John Bell Hatcher. And in the terms of uh, the history of paleontology, especially American paleontology, John Bell Hatcher was a, is essentially considered a kind of a legend. 
Um, he um, had done a lot of work out west. He found some of the first like Triceratops specimens. And uh, anyway, so in the winter of 1887 and, and also into the beginnings of 1888, um, Hatcher came to Prince George's County. And he started in the southern part of the county, and he was finding fossils, but most of what he was finding were actually the remains of things like ancient whales, sharks, things that are much younger, and he was able to kind of, you know, piece that information together. But he wasn't quite finding dinosaurs, and it was starting to frustrate him a little bit. So essentially asking around, he was was basically pointed to northern Prince George's County. And uh, he was tipped off that some pine cones um, that were considered being very ancient in the, during the age of the dinosaurs were being found in basically what is now the dinosaur park area. And so Hatcher came in and, yes, he, he found within these uh, iron ore pits um, the remains of prehistoric reptiles. Uh, so John uh, basically collected a bunch of spe specimens. He sent them back to Marsh. And later in 1888, Marsh wrote up a short paper describing these uh, dinosaur fossils in detail, and he wound up uh, naming a, a whole series of new species. Um, so he had large meat-eating dinosaurs, which he referred to Allosaurus medius, and Allosaurus is a Jurassic-type dinosaur. Um, he had teeth of a dinosaur he ran up calling Prichondon, which he thought was a big Stegosaurus-type animal. And, uh, of course, Stegosaurus is also Jurassic. And then lastly, he found the remains of large, long-necked planting dinosaurs called sauropods. Um, and he wound up calling the, uh, them a single genus called Pleurocelis, um, based on the, the, the kind of the hollow shapes of the vertebrae. Um, but he thought he had two species. He thought he had a, a typical giant sauropod animal um, based on a few bones. And then he found uh, there was a, a multiple series of smaller uh, long neck dinosaur bones, which he thought they were dwarf dinosaurs. And he called that Pleurocelis nanus. And so... Uh, Based on this information, Marsh went back to Powell and said, you know, based on what, uh, you know, Hatcher collected and from what my observations of the fossils I've been finding out west, I do believe that the dinosaurs that are found uh, near Washington, D.C. and in, in the Laurel area um, are, in fact, Jurassic in age. And is a good and at the time, that's that's uh, a good assumption to make because of all the information he collected out west. And um and that's kind of where we kind of left off. He was like, yeah, there's multiple species in, of dinosaur remains uh, in the in Prince George's County. Um, but most of it was like, you know, small bits of bone, teeth. Um, but then the, the vertebrae and, and other skeletal parts of Pleurocelis was, was fascinating to them. Um, but this will move on to phase two. So phase three is kind of like a revision. Um, so after Marsh passed away in 1899, um, a lot of those fossils that Marsh had collected were actually were sent back to um, basically the federal government, essentially to the Smithsonian. Because um, by the time Marsh, um, before he passed, he actually kind of wound up uh, uh, running a foul with the federal government. Uh, and there was calls that he was abusing uh, funding and things like that. And so they wanted everything that the USGS had paid for uh, to be returned to Washington, D.C. and be uh, housed in the collection at the Smithsonian. And so the core of the Maryland dinosaur fossil uh, record is at uh, the Smithsonian based on the stuff that was collected by John, uh, uh, by John Bell Hatcher. So um, after Marsh died, he was uh, his predecessor was a gentleman by the name of Richard S. Lull. And he worked with John Bell Hatcher and kind of like relooked at the fossils, um, especially of these, these you know, sauropod long neck dinosaurs. And they concluded that they, in fact, will probably best refer to Astrodon, which was named in, in uh, 1859. Um, but they kind of kept the, the, the three separate species just because, you know, we only have so much information. Um, we'll just kind of, we'll best keep these uh, as, you know, three separate animals this time. Um, but at this time, also Lowell in, in 1911 described some foot bones that he thought were from a, a small plant-eating dinosaur, um, kind of like the dinosaur version of an antelope. And uh, But it wasn't until the 1920s, however, that the curator of fossil reptiles uh, at the Smithsonian, Charles W. Gilmore, relooked at everything that was collected from Maryland and uh, kind of made some revisions. So he looked at the Astrodon fossils and he said, you know, I think these are actually a single species. These are all should be referred to Astrodon as uh, Astrodon Johnson and I. And this uh, little plant-eating dinosaur that Law described actually were the remains of an ostrich-like dinosaur. And the funny thing about those ostrich-like dinosaurs, they are only known from the Cretaceous period. 
And so Gilmore proposed that all the fossils that were collected from Maryland um, in northern Prince George's County were, in fact, Cretaceous in age. And I'll go over about the timeline in a minute and what is important because um, the Jurassic is older and the Cretaceous is a little bit younger. So it kind of helped things kind of, you know, shift around. Um, but then it goes into our next phase and next and final phase, which is we are still into this day. Um, so for much of the time of the history of Dinosaur Park, the Dinosaur Park region, um, there were these series of iron mines. And it was kind of a cottage industry for basically the uh, the Laurel, the Burkirk, and the Conti areas. And so, you know, this, it was a very uh, important source of income. But as we know, understand, like, the, the progression of the iron industry, um, they found better sources out more west. And so the iron mining kind of shifted into clay mining. And so much of the bedrock in within the area of Dinosaur Park and also between, uh, you know, from where we're located to up to uh, Baltimore, um, these clay mines became very much more profitable, and these were also for using uh, the clays to make bricks and other and just things like pottery and things like that. Um, so, but clay mining is far far more um, invasive to destroying these uh, bedrocks where these fossils are contained. So, where iron mining, it was actually a little bit more selective. So there were major swaths of fossil bearing uh, lands that were just obliterated during the clay mining process. And so uh, the area that is now Dinosaur Park, it was pretty much in private hands through much of its history up until about the mid uh, 1990s. And about that time, the the quarry operators for the clay mining uh, companies, uh, they were essentially, you know, the clay mining is pretty much drying up. Um, we're probably going to sell the land for development. Well, all this time, you know, the local paleontology community, people from the Smithsonian and other universities, you know, they've been you know, coming into these areas and they had permissions from the, the, the landowners to collect fossils uh, here and there as they could. And so there is a, a, a nice collection in the Smithsonian of stuff that was kind of collected from like uh, the 1920s up until fairly recently. And, um, but when the, the paleontology community was catching wind that the property that still bared dinosaur fossils was going to be sold for development they rallied and essentially uh asked you know hey we need to protect this what's left of the fossil site and because they are still they're still dinosaur fossils here and we need to conserve that they're rare for our side of the country and so some negotiations were made and essentially what is le what is left of the fossil beds was sold to uh to my employers the maryland national capital parks and planning commission and it was developed into a public uh, uh research and interpretation site and so they was basically left of these fossil uh this fossil site is essentially barely two and a half acres and that's it and after all this long history of, of finding all kinds of cool things uh along near conti road um this you know two acre section is is what's left but it's still producing fossils and so um just before the park was itself was open um some sediments were collected by the university of oklahoma and uh, they've been processing it for a number of years. And in fact, it wasn't until uh, as recently as 2018 that they finally published on the stuff that they collected. And there's a whole series of cool stuff, which I'll show you in a moment. They found lots of different kinds of smaller animals and more dinosaurs. Um, but anyway, um, and a little bit more history. In, in 1998, um, on October 1st, uh, Astrodon Johnson and I uh, was named the official Maryland State Dinosaur of Maryland. For those of you who don't, don't know that there was a state dinosaur, well, now you know. And then the park itself was developed and opened in 2009. Um, and it just kind of give you some, you know, metrics. You know, we we receive, you know, somewhere between uh, three to 4,000 visitors a year um, since 2018. And, um, but it wasn't until very, very recently when uh, we've started noticing some interesting things coming out of our hillside um, that led us to do uh excavate at our park and led to some amazing discoveries especially this year uh particularly uh, we have some major finds but let me talk a little bit like why are we finding some fossils so it's kind of like the geology and the environment uh for our dinosaur park back uh in ancient times so let me talk about the mesozoic time scale so i've already mentioned things like the jurassic and cretaceous and these are all parts of a, a bigger section of time called uh the mesozoic period and so uh 
you don't know, much of life occurred in three major time periods. There was the, the Paleozoic, which had all the major groups of life uh, evolve and spread out throughout across our planet. You had the Mesozoic, which is known as the Age of Reptiles, uh, which I'll go into in a little bit more uh, detail in a second. And then the Cenozoic, which is the uh, the era that we live in right now, um, which is also known as the Age of Mammals. And we're still continuing into the Cenozoic. But for the Mesozoic, we break it down to three parts. Uh, so there's the Triassic, and the Triassic has the very first dinosaurs near the very uh, tail end of it. And so the little dinosaur there is called Coelophysis. Um, and it's really well known, for, especially out in the, the southwestern part of the United States. Uh, then you have the more famous known Jurassic. There's a lot of TV series and books and things like that that uses that as a moniker. Um, but then it also has some famous dinosaurs such as Stegosaurus, which is found at the very end of the Jurassic period. And then, of course, you have the Cretaceous, which probably has the, the most famous dinosaur of all time, Tyrannosaurus rex, and other dinosaurs such as Triceratops and Velociraptor. But in the terms of Dinosaur Park, um, we are, as Gilmore has uh, strongly suggested back in the 1920s, we are in the early Cretaceous. And uh, this is about the time where we're, where we're at. So we're somewhere approximately between 115 to 112 million years ago. Um, to put that in perspective, that is 50 million years older than Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops and Velociraptor. Um, and for sci more scientifically, specifically, we're known as the at the Aptian Albion uh, transition, um, which is a major point in time with some serious uh, transitions in terms of the dinosaur faunas were starting to occur. Uh, so some of the, the animals that we've uh, had during the early Cretaceous were kind of remnants of things you see in the Jurassic, long neck dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs, armored dinosaurs, and big uh, non-Tyrannosaurus rex predators. Uh, but then you start to get the ancestors of the things we, we would uh, we would be more recognized of, things like Velociraptor, ancestors to Triceratops, and ancestors to T-Rex. Um, in terms of the global perspective of the early Cretaceous, especially in North America, um, this is where North America was essentially kind of starting to take its more modern shape. It was, it was more of an isolated landmass, so there might have been some island connections between uh, Asia and Europe. Um, there's actually a history in the Cretaceous period where our continent was actually divided by a great seaway, but this this time frame, 115 million years ago, wasn't quite there yet, but the seaway was starting to form. But the, the one connection we had still allowed for big, large dinosaurs to cross across the, the continent and we have forms at dinosaur park that are very similar if not specific uh to animals that we find out west places in like oklahoma texas wyoming and in utah um and then at this current time where dinosaur park is located um it's pretty much a uh, a coastal drainage uh plain so lots of uh kind of swampy kind of lands and things like that. But during this time per period, which you consider the Aptian Albion transition, um, there was actually a cooling trend, which actually was kind of drying things out. So uh, there was probably uh, seasonal monsoonal rains, maybe bouts of uh, forest fires occasionally when it got uh, too dry. In fact, there's some actually direct evidence of that at Dinosaur Park. We find chunks of charcoal occasionally actually in our rocks. Um, and then in terms of the rocks themselves, uh, we are part of what's known as the Patuxent Formation, which in uh, historical times has also been known as the Arundel Formation or the Arundel Clays. In terms of the larger stratigraphic story, um, the, the Patuxent Formation is part of a, uh, the lowest member of the Potomac Group, which is a, a expansive set of series of rocks that stretches all the way from northern Virginia and all the way into southern uh, New Jersey. And they usually consist of largely clay, sands, and ironstones. Um, and they're the Potomac group itself is really, really well known for plant fossils. In fact, some of the very first historical evidence of the oldest uh, flowering plant fossils comes from the Arundel clays and, uh, and especially around, um, you know, the Maryland area. And so we kind of owe part of our history of, you know, flowering plants because, you know, our diet is based on flowering plants uh, to this time period during the early Cretaceous. And uh, there's still some debate whether the, uh, what we call the Arundel clays um, is a distinct uh, formation or member of the Patuxent uh, formation, um, or is it just a, a kind of a, a facies that kind of pops up here and there over time, um, just because of whatever the environmental conditions uh, permit. Uh, but this is what Dinosaur Park used to look like 150 million years ago. Again, so it's a coastal drainage. This is actively slow moving, flowing waters. Um, dumping into the ancient Atlantic Ocean. Uh, 
the best way I could probably describe the uh, as a living analog to this environment, I would highly recommend you guys take a trip to the um, the Patuxent River Park, uh, which is actually part of our, our Parks and Planning Commission area. It's it's a perfect analog to what this environment was like. So this is a river that's slowly moving out towards the Chesapeake, and it's fully laden with the uh, fine grain sediments, which would deposit down to be clay. And anyway, so. Um, these drainages uh, back 150 million years ago, they were lined with uh, sequoia woods and cypress. So it's very, very tall trees. Um, of course, there's all kinds of interesting cre creatures that lived in and out of the waters there. So there's a whole variety of fish, turtle, crocodiles, um, and then, of course, there's all variety of different kinds of dinosaurs. But the, what the park represents itself is the bottom of this river. So all the sediments that we see at the park, which are naturally occurring, um, is basically what the uh, the river has basically dumped its load and and continue flowed on, um, and this is what the park essentially looks like. It's a lot of our visitors who come out to our park uh, during non our our non public days. They kind of see this kind of clay hillside, and a lot of them are kind of like, "Well, this is it." It's like, "Well, yeah, this is it," and it's it's rich in fossils. Um, the middle picture in the lower section uh, row there. Uh, kind of shows what the surface is like. So there's lots of pieces of ironstone, which is the orange rocks you see there. There's clay, which is the gray. Um, but where that finger is pointing at is a tiny little white crocodile tooth. So people expect when they come to our park to see these like massive bones you just eroding out of the hill. That's not quite what we usually see there. A lot of times what we see is just uh, fragments and they usually will blend in into the sediments themselves. So the picture on the lower right there is actually a chunk of bone eroding out and there's kind of a squash penny for for scale there and that's has been typically what we've been finding at dinosaur park tiny little teeth and bits of bone um that you know if we are lucky enough to after it rains uh, we can just pick up and the rain is very important for us because the bedrock being clay it's easy it washes away leaving behind like the iron stones and the fossils for us to pick up uh uh, and just in terms of local stratigraphy, and this is a, a obligatory thing I have to do as a paleontologist, I have to show you how rocks look like in cross section. Um, there's three major types of, of clays that we see uh, on site. There's a whitish uh, tan gray clay that you see at the very base of the hill. It hardly has any kind of fossils in it, or even it barely even has ironstone really. Um, and then there's this dark gray uh, band of clay, which are, we're now trying to figure out more of the environment um, by its chemistry right now. Uh, with some help within the University of Kansas. Anyway, this is this this is a section that's just loaded with fossils. So we find carbonized wood. We find uh, basically the molds and casts of invertebrate animals like snails and clams. Lots of uh, you know vertebrate fossils in terms of teeth and bones and and other items. And then there's a a, a tan clay. It's just above that, and at the very base of it, we can still find uh, bones and fossil wood. Uh, but when you get higher in there, so far we haven't found much more um, up in section from from this site. So, um, but that and that tells us something. So the question is, is that is this dark gray band clay something that unique that occurred during a special event, or is this just part of just some weird kind of you know depositional type thing um, in terms of the channels that were there? And we're still trying to figure that out. And um, I, I'm thinking that it's possible that these could represent this this dark gray bed could represent a special event that occurred where a forest fire happened, and um, but then monsoonal rains came in and washed everything in and made basically this one deposit dark gray because of the ash and 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 debris that we're finding there in terms of the plants. Um, and then, of course, there's this bone bed. So the bone bed was in the news recently this year, and uh, this is the first dinosaur bone bed to be dif uh, discovered uh, since the one that John Bell Hatcher found um, in 1887. And the one that Hatcher found was actually found down the road from us. Um, I do believe it's somewhere near the uh, um, the USDA uh, uh, center that's just near the end of uh, Route 1, not far from uh, – University of Maryland. But ours is unique in that we have found so far seven species of dinosaurs, along with a bunch of other smaller critters. And um, and of course, it's also just loaded with plant fossils as well. And they're all scattered together. So kind of, again, lending to this idea that, um, you know, water is kind of flowing stuff together. And we're thinking that 
what happened is that uh, with all the plant material we had there, it log jammed all these bones together. Um, but there is some so a close association in, in some of it. So uh, the dark orange there represents the leg bones to a big meat eating dinosaur, uh, which got us really excited this year. And uh, of course, there's also the you know we have armored dinosaurs, we have the long neck giant uh, plant eaters, and there's also a lot of little uh, predatory dinosaurs that were found uh, in our dig so far. And I'll go into more details on that in a second. Um, but here's some pictures of our, our bone bed excavations. And so for those of you who are going to be joining us uh, later this month, uh, this is where we're going to be working. It's basically this one hillside. Uh, so to the left there are some of the, the very large material that we found. So that's the shin bone of a giant meat-eating dinosaur and another large rock that has uh, a vertebra inside of it. The middle picture is a, a massive armored dinosaur tail tailbone, essentially. Um, the picture on the upper right corner is me holding a weird flat bone, which we still don't know what it is yet. And of course, you know, our typical excavation uh, scene is uh, in the lower left, lower right there too. Oh, so what are we finding at Dinosaur Park? And I'm, I'm giving you guys uh, kind of a general overview of everything we found, including the bone bed material. Um, so where the fossils occur, we find them in the iron stones, which again, they were be they were originally mined in the 1800s. Uh, those iron stones, are, again, are loaded with plant debris and plant impressions, most of which we cannot identify because they're just so so kind of like poorly preserved. But again, they're, they're loaded. Um, and there, you can also find chunks of carbonized wood in some of those large iron stone blocks too. And every once in a while, kind of like in this in the middle picture there, in these iron stones, you will find bone as well. But we can also find bones and teeth uh, isolated by themselves just in the clays. So um, in the upper left corner, that's a tiny little crocodile tooth, which I showed you earlier with a little finger point. And then the lower left picture is a natural cast of a snail shell that we found at a park. So we do get, um, you know, the the they're not these the fossilized shells of. Uh, or the body fossils themselves of clams and snails, but they are the molds. So they were infilled by sediments and then the shell themselves kind of dissolved the way, leaving kind of like these copies of rock of these, uh, you know, snails and clams. Um, but like I mentioned before, plants are, are pretty common at a park. Um, you can find pine cones. Uh, the pine cones that we find there are primarily related to uh, species of a sequoia or sequoia relative, but we also find pine cones of uh, cypress trees too. And then there's thousands upon thousands of pieces of carbonized wood scattered throughout the entirety of the park. And every once in a while, we'll find these huge massive chunks, uh, especially in our, our dig operation. Some of these chunks can be actually absolutely large. So here's my team who are excavating a large log of lignite. And again, this is probably some relative to a sequoia tree. And uh, so we have pieces that come out of the ground. Sometimes they're, you know, three to four feet long on average, but then we have we have pulled up things that can be six to seven feet long. Um, and those are huge fossils in, in themselves. Um, in terms of the animals, um, especially the vertebrate animals, uh, we do have evidence of sharks. So our particular species of shark we find in our park is called Egertononis basanus. Um, the adult fossils of these, of uh, fishes are usually found in marine water, especially off the coast of England. Uh, but they are known from juvenile fossils, especially from our park and elsewhere in North America. And what su suggests is that this species of shark will swim up uh, riverways that are connected to uh, oceans, and they will lay their egg cases in the rivers, and then the adults will go back out to sea, and then the, the babies will essentially hatch out from their egg cases and live part of their lives in the river system. Uh, we also have currently North America's oldest stingray fossil. It is the most stingray fossils you can have. It is the literally the sting or the barb um, of a stingray. And up until this discovery, the oldest uh, uh, stingray fossil in North America came from younger rocks in uh, about 100 million years ago uh, in essentially central Texas. Uh, the oldest stingray barb that's ever been found previously was actually from Lake Cretaceous rocks uh, from Spain. So this is actually a very important find. It tells us that, yes, yeah, stingrays had stings uh, as far back as 115 million years ago. Uh, the very oldest stingray fossils actually do come from, I believe, Portugal. There's just a few series of, of teeth. Um, but uh, in terms of stings, ours is the oldest on the planet right now, and we currently have the oldest North American uh, stingray fossil. 
but unfortunately, I cannot tell you more than that. Apparently, all stingrays have basically the same same structured of sting uh, on their tails. They really don't vary uh, vary, so we can't tell you what family of of stingrays they come from, uh, just from a barb. So, but I, I'm hoping to publish this uh, on the specimen uh, by next year. Uh, there's all kinds of varieties of bony fish. So we have uh, bow fins, which you can still find in our native waters to this day. But our particular species is an older type um, that went extinct during the Cretaceous period. Um, we find gar-like scales, but it comes from a, a relative of a gar, so it's not a true gar. Um, they're short-faced animals that were probably omnivores. So they probably uh, were feeding on both plants and animals um, in the raw system. And then we have these kind of deep body forms called pycnodonts. Now, what's funny about pycnodonts, they usually are marine fishes, but some have been found in kind of brackish to coastal freshwaters. And so we have these funny little uh, crushing teeth that form these little divots, which is something you only see in fish. Uh, speaking also fish, we also have lungfish. This is one of my favorites. Uh, for those who don't know, lungfish are still alive today on this planet, um, but they are now extinct in North America. You only find them alive in places like South America, Africa, and Australia. And we now know we have at least two species of lungfish uh, occurring at a park. We have a giant form that could have been about somewhere around six feet long called uh, Ceratotus cranzi. And then we have a little guy we call Ceratotus texanum, which has been known originally from Texas. Um, but we now have a record of it in Maryland. And then uh, getting a little closer to land, uh, we do have evidence of an amphibian. We're still not quite sure what kind of amphibian. It's just a single vertebra. That was serendipitously collected from our park, and either it come from a frog or a salamander. It's they're they're not distinct enough to really say which is which yet. So, but we do know we have some sort of of uh, amphibian within our waters. There is lots and lots of turtle fossils to be found in our park. At least we have identified uh, three different types. Um, so we have this one animal called Arundel emmys. Arundel emmys is known from actually more complete material, including a skull. And uh, originally, historically, it was called uh, an animal called Gliptops, and Gliptops is a Jurassic turtle. Uh, so there was actually quite a few million years between the two. So uh, Arundel emmys is probably more the appropriate name. Uh, name Achilles is a kind of a sna uh, alligator snapping turtle type turtle that is heavily armored. It had a very sharp beak. And um, what I mean by armored, it actually had spikes on both its arms, legs, and a tail. And then we have another giant form that had a very smooth shell um, and kind of like digging like feet, but they also had a, uh, a shell that was probably almost three feet long and a massive, uh, almost alligator snapping like turtle like jaws. Um, and there's some interesting stories in terms of like how this thing looks. And it also was super armored, it had lots of spikes and things on its neck and, and its uh, feet. And it's from a specimen um, that was collected from the, the late eighties uh, from the general region of the park uh before the park was a park and um we think it was probably something kind of like what we we see in amazonian river turtles probably live in the river channels and things like that um but it may actually be related to things we find in uh in the fossil record from like australia and in africa uh so we'll have to work on that one a little bit more um but when you come to our parks especially when we are excavating you know turtle shell tends to be just very flattened bone uh so these are just some shell segments uh from probably a rundle enemies um, but this is usually what we find uh, in the field. They're kind of uh, clayed over and 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 well covered, um, adhered with clay. Uh, we do have a series of different types of crocodiles. So these are two of the larger forms. Um, we have one called a goni folded, which kind of they have somewhat resembled like modern alligators and and some other crocodiles. Um, their teeth are the most common animal fossil you will find uh, throughout our park. Uh, so it's not dinosaurs that we find uh, most often. It's crocodiles, uh, in all honesty. Um, then we have a giant four called a phyllidosaur. And phyllidosaurs are some of the biggest crocodiles of all time. Um, based on the fossils that we have found in our park, the largest that we know of so far is probably was around 25 feet. Um, and they have, tend to have very narrow cone-shaped uh, teeth for catching fish. Um, and then uh, we've been excavating some out of our, our excavation. So uh, the picture on the left is a, is a phyllidosaur tooth, a very large one. Um, and then uh, that is Cody Ewing, who's a, a, a army photographer uh, who, who volunteers with us. And he's holding a goni folla tooth that he found in our excavations. Um, so we've been finding some uh, isolated crocodile teeth in our digging uh, sessions. 
Um, but then we also have some really, really tiny crocodiles. Uh, so the one on top is an animal called a uh, Bernasarded. They were they had very special crushing teeth, and um, they probably ate snails. That was probably one of their preferred diets. It's been proposed that these little crocodiles with the crushing teeth ate lots of little gastropods. Uh, but then we have a tiny little more predatory uh, type of crocodile. In fact, their teeth are almost dinosaur-like. Uh, they were probably terrestrial, and they're house cat size. So they probably were running around chasing um, little rodent-like mammals, early mammals. Um, so like this this particular one is an animal called an autophosaur, and it's chasing a little uh, early mammal. It was kind of like the Cretaceous version of a guinea pig. We have uh, some evidence of flying reptiles, which we call pterosaurs. We have one isolated tooth, so we have a tooth form uh, occurring at a park. Um, it just doesn't, this particular tooth does not look like anything like a crocodile or a dinosaur. It has all the hallmarks for a pterosaur. Um, and then this is so far as the only evidence we have for pterosaurs right now at, from our park. And of course, are the mammals. So what's really fun is that, so the animal in the upper left is called a Ronalconodon. It was one of the first mammals to be uh, described um, in the, if I believe in the early 2000s or, or, or late 1990s. Um, and it's from a, a, a nearly complete jaw, and the jaw is not much bigger than my thumbnail. So if you look at your own thumbnail, that's how big the jaw is. But they were able to to X-ray and CT scan it. And what's amazing about this little guy is that his teeth are very much like you see, see in active carnivores, uh, especially like modern carnivores like wolves. And so this little mammal was probably running around eating other cre creatures. In fact, there's evidence of this relatives actually eating baby dinosaurs. And then the little guy in the lower left is an animal called a grillamese. And it's only known from a single tooth that's about the size of a grain of rice. And that, again, it was found serendipitously at our park. Um, it belongs to a group of mammals called multi-tuberculates. And multi-tuberculates, they went extinct just after the age of the dinosaurs in the early Cenozoic. Um, and they have a lot of uh, evolutionary similarities to what we see in modern rodents. So they have uh, enlarged incisors for, for chewing, uh, you know, various different types of things and flat crushing teeth. Um, the reason why we st they went extinct, we're still not sure, but um, more likely they were outcompeted by our, uh, some of our own relatives uh, like true rodents and rabbits and things like that. Of course, now we get to our namesake, the dinosaurs of Dinosaur Park. So we'll start with our state dinosaur, uh, Astrodon Johnson. I. And again, just to reiterate, um, most of what we know about this dinosaur is from juvenile remains. And so from the bone bed that uh, John Bell Hatcher discovered in 1887, uh, they found enough to kind of give a, a, a rough reconstruction of what this thing uh, looked like. Most of the juvenile fossils of Astrodon, they're roughly the size of, of an animal that would have been about the size of a Shetland pony. So not very big at this stage. Um, and then adult remains of Astrodon are extremely rare. Um, most of what we find are a few limb bones and, and isolated teeth. Um, for, so, for example, before our park became a park, and one of the, the spearhead uh, reasons why they wanted to conserve this area was that this massive femur was discovered in 1991 uh, from our park area. And it's now on display at the Maryland Science Center. Um, it originally was collected and then given to the Smithsonian. Uh, but the Smithsonian has now this long-term loan with the Maryland Science Center. And um, uh, some of our recent things that we have found in our park. So we have found the, the you know, the namesake, the astronaut teeth at our park. We have adult and juveniles. Um, and then we found a, a nice little hand claw uh, a few years back, uh, just in the, in the begin very beginnings of our dig. Um, and to give you an idea of size, this thing is massive. So uh, we roughly estimate this animal to be somewhere between 60 to 70 feet in length. And uh, they were kind of giraffe-like animals using their long neck to reach the tops of trees. Again, the most common things we find at our park are tree fossils. So, you know, these are feeding off of things that are probably like sequoias and cypress. Um, and just kind of give you an idea for scale. Yeah, so the, the picture... So the picture on the left is from the Maryland Science Center in Baltimore. So you can see this uh, up close with, the again, the giant bone that's found in our park. But the other picture on, on the right there, that's at the North Carolina Museum. Uh, of natural history in Raleigh, and that's me for scale, just kind of idea. I, I, I'm about 5'10", and I barely come up to its uh, elbow, so um, so yeah, these things are pretty, quite large. Um, however, this is where it's getting us very exciting right now. So these are fossils that were collected this year, and so uh, what these represent is a, is a rear foot claw, so some of these long-necked dinosaurs had almost like turtle-like feet in the back of their foot. Um, but we found two tailbones uh, from near the end of the tail. 
and they are distinctly shaped. They are not Astrodon. Um, Astrodon has very flat ends in terms of their vertebrae, um, but this one, uh, these two we found are, are rounded and they actually go together. So there's actually some association being found. So this is super exciting. And it belongs to a different branch of the, the sauropod uh, family tree. And so the shape of these bones uh, is actually very reminiscent of a dinosaur called Sauroposeidon. And during the early Cretaceous, Sauroposeidon was actually one of the largest dinosaurs ever we found in the western part of, the, of, the, of North America. Um, so like I said before, Astronauts is, is, is estimated somewhere between 60 to 70 feet. Sauroposeidon minimally would have been 80 feet and could have been up as long as 112 feet. So um, we always had such pride in saying, you know, Astrodon is the largest dinosaur on the east coast of the United States, um, but it may be dethroned by our new dinosaur we found this year. So uh, we'll keep you posted and if we find more. Um, but uh, it's exciting that we now have two giants uh, living in this state. Um, speaking of giants, we have eaters of giants. So this is the, the large apex predator, Acrocanthosaurus. Um, the skeleton on the left there is actually, again, at the... Uh, uh, North Carolina Museum of Natural History, and then that's our reconstruction on on the right there. Um, this was an animal that was roughly the size of Tyrannosaurus rex, so it reached about a size of somewhere between 38 to th uh, 39 feet, and T. rex gets somewhere between 38 to 40 feet, um, depending on on the specimen, of course. But anyway, um, we find teeth of Acrocanthosaurus uh, ever so often at our park. In fact, we just actually found one at the end of October, uh, very recently. And a lot of times, you know, dinosaurs shed their teeth throughout their lives. And so we find these things that kind of are just like teeth that just fallen out the mouths of these animals. Um, and this is what, primarily what we knew uh, from uh, of this animal from the state of Maryland uh, was just some of these teeth. And some of these teeth can be quite large, but what's really getting us exciting is what we found this year. So these are bones of Acrocanthosaurus found within our park. The picture on the left was actually the initial bone that was leading us to start excavating at our park. It's just an ironstone block that was about five feet long, but inside of it was a bone that's four feet long. And we went back and forth on what kind of animal this could have been. And it wasn't until we actually were able to excavate it out and flip it over, we realized, you know, it's it's got the right the morphology, the shape to be the thigh bone or the femur um, to a large predatory dinosaur. And it really also tipped us off is that uh, in April, the very end of April, we found the shin bone. And that's actually what led us to go, you know what, I think we have a bone bed here now um, to this giant meat-eating dinosaur, a bunch of other things. Um, and then a few months after that, we found the foot bones. So we have the thigh bone, we have the shin bone, and we have foot bones. So we have potentially a almost complete leg of this giant uh, monstrous dinosaur um, just in time for Thanksgiving. So we'll have a massive turkey dinner. Um, but this is where we're getting super excited about it, and um, we're in the process of preparing all these fossils. Um, all these are now extracted and back at our lab, and we're doing the painstaking process of removing all the sediments uh, so we can have a better understanding what the detailed anatomy uh, is for these things. Um, but in terms of predatory dinosaurs, we also have a, a whole host of smaller ones. So we have our own raptor, uh, it's famous you know, from the Jurassic Park films, so it's Velociraptor. Ours is uh, an animal called Deinonychus, and it actually Deinonychus was the inspiration for the original Jurassic Park Velociraptors in the film. Um, as they are described, uh, uh, Velociraptor is actually a smaller animal. It's not much bigger than the size of a turkey, and Steven Spielberg thought that was too ridiculous for a movie, so he wanted to make it bigger. So, so someone said, hey, why don't you use Deinonychus? And he's like, okay, but they kept the Velociraptor name. Uh, we find isolated teeth, and we found a few bones of this animal. Uh, within our park. In fact, this this particular dinosaur is the second most common uh, dinosaur tooth type you'll find uh, if you come visit us, if you're lucky. Um, we also have some rare things and called an animal called Ricardo Estia. It's kind of a Velociraptor uh, mimic in a way. It has a much longer jaws, very narrow teeth. And where people are finding these fossils um, throughout much of the Cretaceous period, uh, they usually found them in, in habitat where there's, it's fairly wet. So there's a hypothesis that this animal was probably a fish-eating dinosaur. And then, of course, the ostrich-like dinosaurs, which is actually one of my favorites. And this is actually, if you visit the Laurel uh, History Museum, um, we have the foot of this dinosaur on display. And in fact, here are some of the elements that are actually are all on the display case uh, at the museum. Uh, so we have uh, we found vertebrae. We found uh, enough of a foot to put it together uh, to kind of get an idea how, how big these things are. 
Um, and originally, these bones were re referred to an animal called Ornithomimus. Um, the problem about Ornithomimus is that its foot bones don't quite match what we find in Dinosaur Park, um, based on now some more complete, complete specimens. And uh, so, and Ornithomimus actually was living much later into the late Cretaceous. So we now think that this animal is probably more closely related to an animal called Arkansas, which is found in Arkansas. And our dinosaur and Arkansas may be related to an animal called Dinocurus, which was a gigantic ostrich-like dinosaur that could have rivaled the size of Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and it probably uses large uh, body size to uh, basically defend itself against giant predators. And most of these animals are probably omnivores. Um, some of them could have been swift-footed. Some of them could have been slow-moving, um, like wading animals, like a stork. Um, but we do find these are the bones we most, up until our bones, that we found most commonly within our park. And then we have a tyrannosaur. Maryland actually has its own type of tyrannosaur that was not uh, recognized until very recently. Most of what we know about this tyrannosaur is from isolated teeth, but their teeth are very telltale of what a early tyrannosaur or tyrannosaurus rex relative would have looked like. This would have been a small animal, again, not much bigger than the size of a pony, uh, but it still had razor sharp teeth like its uh, predecessors and it also its uh, descendants. And then uh, we have some other plant-eating dinosaurs besides Astrodon. One of our more interesting ones, and we find more commonly in our park, is an animal called Prichondon crassus. So the teeth of Prichondon are the most common dinosaur fossil you will find. Um, and again, like I mentioned before, dinosaurs will shed their, their teeth all throughout their lives. And we think the reason why we find so many Prichondon teeth um, is because this animal is kind of possibly living kind of like a hippopotamus does today, living along the edges of rivers and lakes, um, feeding off the vegetation and these more uh, uh, wet environments. And so, so far what we knew uh, about Prycon, it was mostly from its teeth. Again, uh, Marsh described this animal in 1888, and it wasn't too, not too long ago where a, a shin bone was found um, of Prychonodon uh, elsewhere in, in Maryland, somewhere between our park and, and Baltimore. But um, uh, just kind of give you some uh, some ideas. So we have enough uh, information that we both have juveniles and adults at our park, based on some teeth and some isolated bones we found. We think we well, let me back up. We thought that this animal was, was still pretty large, um, and it was similar to an animal called Pleuroplites, found in Utah. And Pleuroplites is about this, you know, about the size of a small tank. Um, and they were it was considered the one of the largest dinosaurs, armored dinosaurs, to be found um, during the early Cretaceous. Um, but we recently, in terms of our excavation, we've been finding some isolated teeth, we've been finding their armor, and then we found tailbones. And the tailbone um, for uh, this armored dinosaur got us extremely excited because, again, body fossils that was not teeth were extremely rare for this animal overall. But when we started showing pictures of our tailbones to people who work on these armored dinosaurs, they got super excited. And then uh, very recently, uh, a few weeks ago, um, I was able to take actually one of these specimens to a professional meeting and actually show these, you know, uh, specialists on armored dinosaurs this thing. And they're like, oh, my God, this thing is absolutely ginormous. Um, we were originally thinking this animal got to a maximum size of 30 feet. And then when we showed this fossil to, especially the one in the middle, to one of these specialists, he was like, no, 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 no. This thing is probably somewhere closer actually to 40 to 45 feet. And again, just going to kind of remind you, Tyrannosaurus rex barely gets to 40 feet. So here is an animal that's spiky in armor, probably lived like a hippopotamus that was larger than a Tyrannosaurus rex. And that just blows my mind. So uh, we're super excited. So we're going to be, again, working on cleaning all the rest of these fossils up. And um, we'll hopefully have a, a more information as we, we excavate and, and continue our, our research. Um there's some other plant-eating dinosaurs. In fact, we even got more evidence, uh, confirmation that we have these things. There's an animal called Tetanosaurus, which is, again, kind of like a dinosaur version of a deer or an antelope. They, they weren't exactly gigantic, but they were herbivores and they were everywhere. Um, most of what we knew about these animals originally was just from a few isolated teeth and some and some vertebrae. And we just now getting some confirmation. We have more in our collection from uh, some specialists looking at our fossils. Um, but also, excitingly, we have evidence of early Triceratops relatives, so these horned dinosaurs. Ours are, are kind of on a small side. They're probably one much bit bigger than maybe like a pug or um, a small dog. And um, what's fascinating is, is actually the history of, from our park of the very first 
oldest evidence of these foreign dinosaurs actually comes from Maryland from our park from isolated teeth. And then a skull was discovered a few years back uh, in uh, Montana, which they called a, a quelops. And uh, our teeth are very similar to what they found uh, in Montana. So we actually now can tie the two together. So, um, well, we love the uh, both park is that we had the first evidence of the oldest uh, horned dinosaurs in North America at first. Um, and then, of course, of all the stuff we've been digging up, uh, we still have our mysteries. And so here's just three examples. So we do find some isolated vertebrae um, that is either crocodilian or they could also possibly be a, some sort of dinosaur but we're not quite sure yet because it's just it's just a you know the centrum which is the part that supports all the connecting parts of your vertebrae your backbones together um, we got some really weird flattened bones that we're trying to figure out what they are in terms of the cleaning process some of them some of these flat bones kind of look like skull material so maybe we have a head we don't know yet uh, especially the picture in the lower right there, um, that almost looks like a jaw uh, from based on some photographs that I've been looking at. Um, it's still too early to say exactly what it is until we actually get the chance to actually clean it up. So this is one of those kind of like stay tuned for more, everybody, uh, as we start uh, processing and, and identifying these new, new fossils. Um, and to kind of just wrap things up. Um, I do want to do some promotion. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, Dinosaur Park is unique that we we welcome the public to come in and uh, assist us in finding new discoveries. Now, we do sometimes, you know, have people come to a park and they want to do it anytime they come visit. Unfortunately, what we the way we do this and to kind of maintain uh, crowd control is that we only have special public days every first and third Saturday of each month. Um, they are free. And uh, we we always encourage people to come out and also come back to these programs. Um, and it's a four hour program. Um, our our time is usually seasonal, so usually we'll do earlier hours around the summer, and then this time of year we're usually doing later hours. Um, but these free programs, you know, you get to, you get to wander the site with us and pick up fossils as they've been roading out. And some of the, the discoveries that that people have made have always blow my mind. Uh, kids in particular are very sharp-eyed, and some of the best dinosaur teeth I've ever seen were made uh, made by children. Um, but we also do also offer private educational programs. So if there's every uh, ever if if you know people who want to do a field trip to to a dinosaur fossil site, uh, think of us. Um, it's only fifty dollars for up to forty people as a flat rate, no matter where you live. Um, and then we also now offer dig experience programs at our park, and you guys are all invited to actually come out later this month for your very own dig ex experience um, uh, for this month. And uh, yeah. before, if you want to have your own private program, it's just $10 per person, um, but the only have, the caveat is that, you one, you have to be eight and older to participate, um, and it's just roughly a three-hour program. And believe me, after three hours, uh, you're going to be tired and ready to go home, so... Um, but with that, I will now open it up to questions, and thank you for listening to me. Okay, thank you so much, JP. That was fascinating, uh, and it's wonderful just to know all of this is really in our backyard and, and has been for millions of years, and uh, you're, you're so knowledgeable and passionate about it, so thank you so much for sharing your work with us uh, and the work of all your, your volunteers as well. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to go through just a few announcements of what we have going on at the Laurel Museum that I'll let JP uh, catch his breath. Uh, there's also some technical questions in the Q&A, JP. So if you get a chance, uh, look through those and see uh, which ones uh, that you can answer. Uh, we are a little over uh, eight o'clock, uh, but we'll still have the recording and we'll hang out for as long as, uh, as, long as you want tonight. So I'm going to keep it recording through our announcements, but I'm just going to kind of zip through them. So give me one second to switch over and share my screen, and then I'll be right back with you. Okay, excellent. So as you heard a couple of times, uh, there are dinosaurs in Laurel, and this presentation that JP gave to us tonight was in support of our current exhibit at the Laurel Museum. It's all Laurel City Limits and Beyond. Uh, and as JP so kindly mentioned, we do have uh, some of the fossils that they have found from Dinosaur Park on display. Uh, and JP and his volunteers were kind enough to, uh, to put them on display, assemble them, set them all up uh, at the beginning of the year. And they uh, have been really the star of the exhibit, I have to say. <laughs> Everyone 
uh, young and old love seeing all the fossils on display and just, uh, just seeing all of the, the drawings and just kind of marveling at what Laurel looked like millions and millions of years ago. And so I encourage you, if you have not been to the Laurel Museum yet, we are open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 12 to 4. Uh, and this will be your chance to see some dinosaurs uh, as well as the rest of Laurel's history while you're there. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, in addition to the It's All Laurel exhibit and our fossils from Dinosaur Park on loan, uh, we do have a temporary display. Currently, it's the photography of Tracy Camilla Johns. Uh, and then next month, we will be transitioning to celebrate uh, holidays in Laurel. And speaking of celebrating holidays, we're very excited because we are reviving our one of our longest traditions here at the Laurel Historical Society, and that is our holiday house tour. Uh, so the last time we held it was back in 2018, so it has been quite a few years. And we are kind of pulling out all the stops, or at least stretching out all the stops uh, across town to celebrate and support our current exhibit, It's All Laurel. So there will be houses and sites in the historic area of Laurel along Main Street and in the historic area. Uh, and then we're also spreading out to other areas uh, further south along Route 1 and into uh, West Laurel area. So please do join us for this tour. Uh, we think we have a great mix of new and old houses uh, and some real treasures in Laurel. So please do join us. It is one of our small winter fundraisers and tickets are on sale for that. Uh, we will be sure to send a follow-up email Email, not only with the link to this recording, but also to where you can buy uh, tickets and additional information about the museum. And that is December 9th. Uh, and then the first weekend of December, we have our holiday open house. That's just a time for uh, some early holiday shopping, uh, some goodies, uh, some special uh, things at the museum, some uh, discounts and special gifts and things like that. And it's your chance to see the all it's all Laurel exhibit uh, before we close for the end of the year on December uh, 17th. Uh, and then just a quick plug uh, to support programs like this tonight. Uh, we do encourage you to become or to renew your membership. Uh, and if you did enjoy this program, uh, to uh, click to have a small virtual donation uh, sent our way. And all that is online. I'll put the links in the chat uh, as well as send it in the follow up as well. Uh, and then just another quick shameless plug, we do have our collectible ornaments. It is that time of the year. Uh, the one on the left is our fantastic exhibit logo. It's all Laurel in full color. Uh, and then the one on the right, uh, we're very excited to announce is our current collectible for 2023, which is the Goody Mansion. Uh, and it's uh, we're celebrating the restoration of it. It's now the offices of the Parks and Rec Department for the city of Laurel. Uh, and it's a fabulous, uh, uh, an historic piece uh, of architecture, and you can read more about it in one of our text panels at our current exhibit. And they are both for sale online and in the museum shop currently. And again, just a quick thanks uh, for everyone for joining us tonight, and especially JP uh, for such a, a fabulous and thorough examination of fossils and dinosaurs and all kinds uh, of life uh, millions of years ago. If you want to contact us, uh, please feel free to do so. We can call our email uh, and check us out. Like I said, we are open Friday, Saturday, Sunday from 12 to 4, uh, right at the very end of Main Street, 817 Main Street. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to check back in. Uh, Abby, thank you for putting all those links into the chat. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to you, Abby, real quick to see if there's anything that we want to highlight from the comments before we uh, send it back over to JP and answer some of those questions. Okay, so I am just going to highlight two quick comments. Uh, thank you to Monica Gribben. I hope I said your last name right. My apologies if I didn't, um, for pointing out that when the Yale Peabody Museum was mentioned earlier on in the lecture, um, that it's been undergoing an extensive renovation. We always love to hear about good museum renovations and them being improved, um, and that it's getting ready to reopen in early 2024. So that'll be exciting to see kind of what changes they've made and what they've added. Hopefully they can display more of their collection. 
So just wanted to highlight that, that there may be more to see soon. Always good to know. Um, Karen Bartimo Bartimo um, said that her dad worked at the brickyard and they found dinosaur bones in the clay bank sometime in the 60s. So that was an interesting comment that was added there. And then I have a shameless plug of my own. I added in the comments um, for anyone who happened to be around the museum this weekend, we had Children's Day. And one of our big focuses was learning all about the Maryland State Dinosaur and that we do have one. Thank you, JP, for educating us as a museum. That way we can help educate others about the fantastic thing that is having a state dinosaur. Um, and we had all of our kids that attended, there were over 60 of them or over 60 like families, people in total um, that came draw out the length of the dinosaur on the sidewalk. And so there were lots of crazy lines all over the place. I think those are most of our comments that I wanted to call out. We are running really short on time because um, we are already over the eight o'clock hour. So I'm gonna turn it over to JP, but just know we had a lot of really fantastic questions. JP probably will not get to all of them, but feel free to like email us and let us know what your questions are. All right, well, I'll answer a couple of these. Uh, so Nick actually asked two. Um, so and then these are kind of important questions. Uh, Nick asks, uh, are people allowed to keep smiles as uh, they find in the park? And um, so the short answer is, yeah, there's two types of fossils that you're allowed to to keep when you come out and visit us. Um, they, again, they're plant fossils. So a piece of the, the lignitized uh, wood um, and then also a piece of the ironstone um, that has some of the plant material inside of it. Uh, we do need to check all fossils before they leave and they cannot be much bigger than the palm of your hand. So no large chunks of wood can leave leave the park. Um, and the other question that Nick had was like, are there any other publications to hunt for dinosaurs uh, in the Maryland area? And the short answer is no. Um, there are no public areas. Most of where you do still find dinosaurs are in private hands or in, in, in uh, uh, government properties. And so you have to get special permission to for look for fossils in those areas. Um, so what else? Uh, so Mark asks, so what type of dating techniques do you use for Cretaceous age fossils? Um, in the case for Dinosaur Park and the early Cretaceous uh, fossils, it was actually fossilized pollen that was used, initially used to really hone in on the age of those early Cretaceous rocks um, that we find there. And then... Um, so let's see, how do you figure out uh, a tiny fossil belongs to a particular larger animal? Uh, usually by a process of elimination and anatomical uh, comparison. So we will base our, our analyses on, you know, what other people's uh, published works are. And we come basically to uh, the best reasoning we can uh, based on those features of those fossils, the anatomical features. Uh, there was a question about, uh, you know, some of the fossils or critters that we reconstructed were fuzzy. Um, and that is based on actual evidence that uh, a lot of the relatives that we have at Dinosaur Park um, uh, did have feathers or feather-like structures on their bodies. And this is based on much more complete uh, fossils, particularly from uh, the early Cretaceous beds of China. Uh, so a lot of the Velociraptor relatives, like Deinonychus, um, they're covered in feathers. In fact, there's even uh, a Tyrannosaur um, that is completely fuzzy. Um, in fact, it's, it's not a small animal either. It's, it's quite large. It's called Eutyrannus. And then uh, some of the horned dinosaurs actually have almost like porcupine quills on the backs of their tails. And that's based on an animal called Cetacosaurus, which is uh, a, a, a cousin to uh, our native uh, small Ceratopsian dinosaurs. Um, let's see. Not sure what the population density of a dinosaurs are in Maryland. Um, it's hard to say. Well, again, dinosaur fossils are extremely rare in Maryland. So, uh, overall, so we really don't know. Maybe our bone bed will, will, uh, figure that out. Um, did the Snowden slaves find dinosaur fossils during the iron oxide mining process? That's an excellent question. It's actually something I've been kind of trying to, to research into um, in terms of the, the African-American uh, contributions to the discovery of dinosaurs within our region. And um, I'm hoping to actually try to find more names and references um, and actually in the field notes that were made by John Bell Hatcher. Um, I've been working with uh, or and trying to contact uh, Yale University, trying to get some more information about that. And then Matt Carano, who's the curator of dinosaurs at the Smithsonian, um, he also has some archive information that might help with that story. 
And then uh, was the iron oxide uh, that Snowden quarried instrumental in protecting the dinosaur fossils? Yes, the iron stone itself is both a curse and a blessing for us at Dinosaur Park. Many of the fossils that we find encased in iron stone keeps those bones, you know, intact. But it is iron stone for a reason. It is uh, it is hard material to work with, and so you have to carefully chip away the the iron stone away from the fossils. And the best way to to give a kind of an analogy to it is kind of like trying to chip concrete off of a porcelain plate. So um, those are, uh, yeah, it's a very difficult situation sometimes with us. But um, then again, sometimes you can find these great crevices in the ironstone that just has a, like a little gap between the bone and the, and the rock, and it just peels away very easily um, on some of the specimens that we worked with. So like I said, it's both a curse and a blessing. All right, JP, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I'm glad I am I'm not the only one that geeks out over stratigraphy and rocks and soil and things like that. So um, yeah, as much as I would love to listen, just, you know, have you talk and, and listen to everything you have going on and all of your research, uh, I think we will cut it off there. Uh, again, if you have any follow-up questions about the museum or about Dinosaur Park, uh, please direct them to us at the Historical Society, and we can always uh, pass them along to JP as well well. Uh, just again, plug uh, for our museum and for Dinosaur Park, please uh, support uh, the great uh, research and activity that's going on in the Laurel area. Uh, and JP, thank you again. Just This was a fascinating talk. Uh, and I just um, hope everyone has a chance to come out and experience uh, the, the whole natural and cultural uh, world around us. So uh, Abby and Genevieve, unless there's anything else, I think I'm going to stop the recording. So I'm just going to say thank you. Uh, I will hang out for a few more minutes, but again, enjoy your evening or whenever you're watching this. Thank you so much for supporting the Laurel Historical Society uh, and Dinosaur Park. All right, thanks.